My name is Simon Clark. I'm the Projects Coordinator for the European Geosciences Union. Um, and welcome to Can I Be a Space Person, a new resource for finding and sharing careers in space science. This webinar asks what careers that there are in the space sector, how do you find them, and also how do you address, address the lack of awareness on the diversity of space careers. Webinar will last one hour, with time for questions at the end. The webinar is also recorded and will be published on our YouTube channel uh, the following week. Um, unfortunately, one of our advertised speakers today isn't well, so let's quickly uh, introduce our two speakers uh, for what we have today. We have Carl Waters, who is a PhD student in space plasma physics at Imperial College London. Cara has been involved in various outreach activities, including the development of I'm a Space Person career postcards. Simon Foster is a solar terrestrial physicist and public engagement lead in the Department of Physics at Space Lab um, at Imperial College London. He leads and coordinates numerous public engagement and outreach activities at Imperial College London, and also lectures on science communication and public engagement. Um, so without much further ado, perhaps uh, Simon, would you like to start? Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I'm here with my colleague, Cara, and we're just going to talk about the um, I'm a space person careers resources, really from uh, kind of conception through to what we're hoping to be is delivery that's now going out. So, um, yes, thank you for joining us. Hopefully you're going to find this uh, useful. And we're um, be really delighted if you could join us with this because we're trying to spread the word and move this just not from the UK, but across the country. So I was going to say, unfortunately, Cara is going to be, I'm going to be Boris Johnson and Cara is going to be my Professor Witty. So she's got to move the slides on. So Cara, can you, next slide, please. Sorry, that's a very British, if you're in the pandemic in Britain, you would understand that. So uh, Martin would be covering this first section. So me and Cara are going to be uh, doing it instead. So uh, hopefully we'll be able to cover what he was going to say. So really at the beginning is a lot of STEM outreach is really targeted at uh, secondary school students. And a big part of that is because um, a lot of universities are seeing that we uh, hope for them to come to our institutions. We are there seeing it as often as a recruitment uh, tool. And so that's where a lot of our outreach is targeted. But this kind of shouldn't be it, really. We should try and um, go across uh, society, really. Um, now, raising aspirations is often given as a big topic in this area, and that's because sometimes people might not have uh, considered a career in science. Uh, for many different reasons, a lot of that is just exposure. So hopefully by going into schools where with the uh, nicest of ways of saying we've got a, a captive audience, a captive market, we can go in and expose these students to areas outside the curriculum and maybe they could aspire to go into a new career or be exposed to something um, that they previously wouldn't have. But as Martin's put here, aspirations can be uh, complicated. It's not just education that is the main uh, reason where people choose to base a career. There's families, there's the environment around them, and there's a lot of different factors that can go into. So one of the other things that we see now is a lot of people talking about science capital. And we shouldn't just be hoping that students go into science for a degree or a career, actually. We should be hoping to um, actually expand the scientific understanding in society. And I always remember an old boss of mine, Professor Joe Hay, was very big on this. Because obviously in the UK and you know across Europe and the globe, um, a lot of science research funding comes from taxation. And so if we wish uh, for that taxation to kind of carry on our science funding, we need the public to understand and appreciate what we're doing. There's a lot of pressure on um, government funding. And so it's important that the public understand what we're doing with their money. You know, there's a cost of living crisis in the UK and across the planet. You know, how can we justify the uh, money going into science? And that's a big thing. And that's kind of getting a scientific literature or uh, understanding in the public. Cara, sorry, I will hand over to you before I witter on too much. Sorry. Yeah, I think the 
a lot of this the idea really is you know all all of the focus is on you know degrees and things like that at least in my experience in recent years so yeah I thought yeah, I was going to say I think God, I'm sure my age but you're a lot closer to coming to university <laughs> to school yeah. when I did my to give away my outreach the outreach I had at school was with a BBC micro when I was in primary school and it had a pen it was called the turtle and I can still remember and I was quite underwhelmed uh and they were quite sad people anyway sorry I was uh, but uh, that was many moons ago but it's trying to expand our understanding thank you very much so as Martin's put here there's a pipeline and that really starts off a lot of it at school but a a lot of this actually takes place at secondary school um and and there's you know several reasons for that one is that again as i talk about recruitment um there's in the uk we have fees now of nine and a half thousand pounds and to charge those fees we have to enter into an agreement it was previously called an offer agreement office of fair access now it's called an access agreement or it might even have changed again but we have to prove that we get a certain percentage of our offers into university come from widening participation students. And these are students, you could ask you from low socioeconomic backgrounds or uh, first generation students, parents and families haven't been to university before. So for example, I would have been considered a widening participation student, first in my family to go to university. Uh, my dad was a postman, an electrician. My mum was disabled. So I would I would be consider myself a kind of poster child WP student. And obviously with this pressure that we've got to get this in, obviously the main thing is we're going to go to secondary school students. We're going to go to the kind of orchard, so to speak, and try and attract these students in. So actually, unfortunately, we don't actually go to the primary school age. I love going to primary school age. It's a long game, but I personally think that's where um we can actually capture students imaginations at that time they're still open-minded they still love science so, cara and probably many of you watching have been in you go into primary school and you say you're a scientist and everyone just goes hooray and you're just like wow today's going to be a good day you go into secondary school student uh, school and that age between about 13 and 15 16 that's a tough gig Okay, so I find it, I call it a dancing monkey routine that you basically have to go on stage and set yourself on fire or something to get a nod of approval out of students. Just because they're self-conscious, you know, that they, they don't want to get excited. They see a science not being cool. So there's this, this issue about long game and short game. And also a lot of scientists are concerned that if they're going to primary schools, you've kind of got to, I wouldn't say, I hate to say, dumb down your science. What understanding of science do the students have at that age? Whereas at secondary school students, especially at A-level, they've got a pretty good understanding of the scientific language and concepts you're going to use, so it's easier to get across. So uh, Martin's saying they hear about basically the, you know, what affects science capital, what affects the environment of science, and it, you can see all these things here. And it could be um, what, and, and also we can say, um, what affects people becoming scientists? A big thing of that is actually, um, do people see themselves as science? Again, there's issues around gender, you know, it seems male, especially physics. Seems you have to be clever uh, to be a scientist. I hope I've disproved that uh, because I don't consider myself. I got lucky. I consider that. Um, again, and it still happens. And I don't know if it happened with you, Cara, but I still hear students. And this is what shocks me saying my teacher has told me not to do physics because it's hard and that blows my mind because or it's a male subject and i've heard girls actually come to open days saying that saying my teacher's tough and and, and that if, if i'd have heard that 20 30 years ago i would have thought it was peculiar in this day and age it just blows my mind that teachers are still saying that um i, I just can't get my head around that that um you know, we, we need to cast the net as wide as possible to bring in um, as many different people into the subjects as possible, into space science as possible. And, you know, through this diversity, it's actually diversity of thought. People with different backgrounds give us a different view on things. And I think that's incredibly important. And so actually, 
a big part of this is highlighting the diversity of careers available to people. Actually, you don't actually have to be a scientist to work in, in the space sector. I know that for me, I was definitely incredibly lucky because I went to a school that was only girls and oh. a lot and a lot of the teachers, they were sort of like, well, the, there was a very strong emphasis of like girls can do anything and they should. And there was like a real strong push. And so I think not and that's not necessarily something that everyone gets. So I know that in my school for A level physics, we had two classes of 15 girls, but I know that in a lot of schools, you might get two girls maximum taking A-level physics. Like by that point, you've just like completely tuned out of it. 25 years ago when I did my A-level school, I'm sure my age, there was, yeah, there was two girls in the class of 15. And there is a lot of evidence to show that in single sex schools, the uptake of physics is massively increased, massively increased in girls only schools. Um, so it, it, it's incredibly, it still is an issue. I was lucky, I had, all my role models in science have all been women, which is, and I I've, I had a peculiarly different route through physics. My head of department, my head of, um, was Anne Tropper. My head of group was Betty Lanchester. I've named my daughter after her. My first boss was Joe Haig. I had a very peculiar all female route apart from my PhD supervisor and I, I now see that I'm, I'm an incredible outlier an incredible outlier but yeah I had a lot of uh, female role models in science which was you know incredibly important sorry Karen next slide please sorry so we've got to see about influence on people coming into science influencing children I must admit I see this I actually have my way of seeing it is uh, I don't know if you've ever seen like a fire triangle you know, you need fuel, oxygen, and heat to make a fire. I see for people going into science, you've got parents, school, environment. Does that make sense? And this is all in here. These are the three things that basically go in. And, and if you kind of have a lack of one of those, you know, we've just talked about schooling. If parent, if teachers aren't supportive, if science, if physics education isn't there, when a lot of schools it isn't, you're going to, struggle to get that pipeline through for example um a lot of schools in the uk do not have a dedicated physics teacher and that's a, a huge problem there uh in the environment and family for example again with widening participation students if you've got no one in your family that's been to university or understands the education system that's going to be a big barrier and also if you've got no one who works in the industry again your environment that's a big problem I only really understood this recently because I had to start um, mentoring my cousin's children because they all left school at 14, as did my parents. Actually, my cousin left school at 16. And they're cabbies and, and, and stuff like that. They've got no idea about how to go to university. They want to be, my cousin's son wants to be an engineer, satellite engineer. And he had no idea of the roots into that career. And so a big part of this is not just highlighting the careers, it's actually highlighting those routes. How do we get through? Yeah, I think what, what you're saying about people not necessarily having that experience, like, I mean, I know that my, my dad went into the RAF after his A-levels. and My mum studied, I think, French. And so it was like when I wanted to do science, they're like, we have no idea what to even do and they were lucky that the school was supportive but if I had gone to a school it wasn't supportive there was no way I would have even done physics. I was lucky I had a physics teacher called Dr Sean again one of the influences in my life and he said to me have you ever cons this course here there's a course at university called physics and space science you'll probably do okay that was his career <laughs> then I was lucky and I went oh well, I'll do physics and space science and I was very lucky my parents literally had no idea and and that's but that that's out there. So actually engaging with parents, teachers, carers, grandparents actually about this, and opening their minds, not just the students, is a colossal thing that hopefully we're going to achieve. But this is this is a big piece of work that actually we're looking at. So talking about the economic environment, this is a big part for the UK. I was going to talk about this myself. That this is a growing sector. It's worth at seventeen point five billion in twenty twenty one, and it's seen by the government as a real area of growth, real area of strength. Uh, we have 
And so the government wants to actually put in, uh, see this as an area in which we can grow the economy. And uh, growth is a big thing in the UK, as it is everywhere, but this is a thing. We've got several spaceports going in. We've got lots, and I mean a lot of startup, um, satellite and space companies. And so, yeah, I, I actually see the the environment, the ecology of space in the UK. I actually, and I'm part of it, but growing massively. And, I, um, and, and yeah, it's, it's a huge growth sector for us. And obviously, that doesn't just mean space scientists. It means a whole raft of different areas. We need lawyers. I didn't know that was a thing, but we need space work. It's a big thing. Um, just logistics, admin, things like that, managers. We need a whole raft of people to go in. Trust me, if it's just scientists doing a lot of those jobs, we're going to have trouble. I do admin now, and I do, I'm do. i not good at it. I, I, so actually, I think professional admin staff, professional managers, is crucially important. Well, I think, yeah, so, I mean, in the UK, we now have two horizontal space ports, one that's functional, one that's coming. So it's in Cornwall in the southwest and in Glasgow in Scotland. And then we also have a vertical, so your more typical rocket launch in the north of Scotland. And I know that They've been very keen with all of this and like, especially with their local areas, trying to educate people around there, pre present them with the jobs and things like that. But I think it is a much wider issue than just those local areas as well. And there's things like uh, Spaceforge, my friend Neil Montero works at, but it, it's just amazing the stuff that the, the actual work that's going into this area. It's real kind of almost science fictiony. So it's amazing and it's really spreading. And luckily the government are on board. Actually, sometimes it's a real struggle to get the government on board, but because the economics are there, the government have kind of really backing this, actually. Actually, when we look at careers or resources that were there already, even though there's, a, I think there's 11 different or nine different sectors down the side in which we could say that the careers are broadly broken down to, about 50, 70, 50 to 70 percent of them are in traditional STEM subjects. You can see here, the scientific is red engineering i think sorry i'm just trying to look is the blue and then purple computing so but actually there's a whole raft of careers beyond that is you know policy education sales is a huge part obviously you've got satellite sales you've got to bring money into these um these areas medicine is a big part of it so actually the broad range of careers advice that is currently there is states, if you want to work in the space sector, you need to be a scientist. But that's actually not true. Actually, we need to cast the net wider. And that's where we came up with the idea of I'm a space person. Uh, I said that this, so this uh, analysis here is actually from our paper that's oh, in yeah. Geoscience sure. Communications uh, from last year. So uh, I will hand over to Cara now for her uh, section, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah. so... Um... Our resource, it's based on our partners who are at Newstem, so that's from Northumbria University, and they have a, phys a kind of set of physics uh, careers postcards. Uh, so we based the format off of this, but they are for people seeing people like me in these roles. And the whole point is that it's based around personal attributes and they can associate themselves with these roles. And so basically the idea is that it's a simple physical resource for children to take home and then they prompt conversations with their key influence. So like their parents or carers, as well as like their teachers. Uh, and then they have an accompanying digital resource as well to find out more about the careers. So that's the format that we based off. So then where I came into the project is actually getting together all of this information to start to make this specific for the space sector. So we looked at existing careers resources, as well as different space industry job listings in the UK. And then we also had contact with uh, contacts in industry. And so a lot of those came from Imperial Space Lab. So on the right are just some of the companies that we contacted. Uh, lots of emails, lots of non-replies, uh, some led to meetings, but yeah. Uh, but we also determined that we're not going to see everything that will be in the sector for the relevant age group. Because if we're looking at children who are around 11, that's, we're looking at maybe 10 years 
and those and the space industry is growing rapidly so we also want to look to the future and see what what jobs might not be there uh, such as things like space tourism and so from this we created a finalized list of 36 careers uh, based on the classifications that we had before so you can see them here and so on the right you can see that our uh, I'm a space person resource is the left bar and you can see that this is much uh, much more evenly distributed in the field in the different uh, classes of jobs than such the space census which is probably the most comprehensive resource that we found and we then matched three of these attributes that we had from the new stem resource uh, and we made sure that these were well balanced so that when children associate themselves with these attributes, they have a good chance of finding essentially what uh, what what they consider themselves to be. And so these these careers range from more typical roles that you'd expect, like an astrophysicist, uh, to others that you might not like. We had mentioned already, like space lawyer or space tourism, or even things like the UK Space Command, which is now a branch of the military. So from this, this is what the postcards look like. So even, although they're based on the new stone ones, these are a little bit different. Uh, so we have this artwork that is suitable for the space sector. And we have made it so that the three attributes are on the front of a postcard. And then you essentially could pick which of those sets of attributes you most associate yourself with. And then you flip that postcard over and it gives you a career that you may be interested in. And so you are basically picking a person like you before you then select the career. And we then also have QR codes to direct to information on the website as well. So you can see here that it gives the category a very short description uh, some details of the routes in and some example employers as well so for the descriptions i thought about these for a very long time because uh, they need to be short enough to fit on a postcard with language to suit the target age group of children who are just finishing primary school just starting secondary school so around 10 to 12 years old and I'd say that these need to be a consistent format, which gives a good overview of the career first, and then has more detail if someone is interested and reads on. So these start with a simple description. So here we have space lawyers work with clients, the courts, and other legal professionals, or structural and mechanical engineers design the structure of spacecraft and components for them. So then we go into more specifics. So Space lawyers may help to write new laws, argue specific cases in a court, or look at how existing laws impact space missions. Or uh, structural and mechanical engineers must use CAD design and model analysis. And then since we're talking about the space industry as a whole, we go into what this role actually brings to the space industry. So we have about the clients may ask for advice and a guidance on specific topics, legal support in a case, or for help with contracts, or that uh, structural mechanical engineers make sure that the spacecraft launches successfully and does its job safely. So then after tackling this, the next thing is to look at the routes into the careers. And it is very difficult to standardize a format for this because the careers are so diverse and so many different uh, uh, categories of career. And so it's important to detail the qualifications such as degrees, but then it is also very important to give alternative uh, routes when we know that when we know of these, because not everyone uh, wants to go off and do a degree really, but they could still take part in the space sector. So for example, we can talk about relevant apprenticeships uh, such as for logistics or tourism, uh, but then also there are relevant degrees as well, such as for business development. Uh, and obviously for your more typical things like astrophysicist as well. So then, because we want this resource to be used alongside lessons in schools, we made links uh, with what you what they will see in schools. So currently, we have links to the national curriculum for Key Stages 2 and 3 in England. And so Key Stage 2 is upper primary and Key Stage 3 is lower secondary. And we link this to all areas, not just science and math, since we are saying that you 
don't have to be a scientist to work in the space sector. And for English, maths and sciences, uh, the national curriculum is broken down into more subtopics. So we have also done that. Uh, so you can see that most of the links here are sort of in maths and science, because that's kind of quite natural uh, for the nature of the jobs that we're looking at. Uh, but also there's a lot here with English. Uh, but also there's a decent spread along the other subjects as well. So even things like art and design, even down to cooking and nutrition uh, are quite important. So then we look at the, the website. So here it's spaceperson.co.uk if you want to have a look. And so it has the same careers as the postcards. And here on the bottom left, you can see that you can, when you go on here, you can select either a class of career that interests you, or you can pick one of the attributes, and then you will see the careers filtered to those associated with what you've picked. And this gives a little bit more information in the postcards because you can see that on the career page on the right, these also give the curriculum links that I was talking about as well. And at the bottom of the page, we even have a little like copy paste thing that you can share on social media with a hashtag uh, saying what which career you've you've chosen, basically. So we'll hand back over to Simon now. So I'm just going to very briefly, just quickly talk about the rollout events we've had, actually, because um, the, uh, last year, actually, uh, this time last year, obviously, the Virgin Orbit was going to launch its rocket from the spaceport in Cornwall. And so the UK Space Agency got in touch with us because they're actually going to put the, they put a mock-up, which you can see in the background there, along Exhibition Road. And Cara came along to that as well. Thank you very much, I will say again. And we, uh, many of us from Imperial, now partners in the Science Museum, Natural History Museum and B&A, came along and actually had uh, tents around that, marquees around that, and talk about space research. And we did a little bit of uh, kind of talk around um, careers in the space sector, but this is actually a precursor for, uh, sorry, next slide. Oh, sorry, I should say there's the head of space lab there, Jonathan Eastwood. Uh, is he your PhD supervisor, Cara? Oh, okay, yeah, so I put Jonathan in there because he's kind of one of my bosses. You can see there and some other very important people. Um, so th that was placed in um, South Kensington, which is kind of, uh, it's called also called Albatropolis. And that's an area of London where there's Natural History Museum, Science Museum, v &A, lots of museums, Imperial College. Um, but we then entered into discussions with the UK Space Agency. Sorry, next slide, please, Cara. Sorry, thank you very much. Um, because the UK Space Agency were interested um, in touring that rocket or doing a kind of tour around the UK to drum up interest in space, but also space careers. Now, luckily, that dovetailed nicely with I'm a space person. We were just starting to produce all our resources, all our postcards. I think, God knows, 72,000. I'm trying to think how many we had printed in the end. It was 2,000 of each resource. It was 72,000. So we just started to put together for a launch. We were going to launch around now. But uh, this seemed an excellent opportunity for us to partner with the UK Space Agency. And they toured around the cities you can see there. Um, a lot of them were coastal. Actually, in, all, also includes Plymouth and a few other places were added afterwards because UK Space Agency and um, BAES, which is Business, Enterprise, Industry, Strategy. Sorry, I'm, oh, I've even written it there, so I should know. Energy, sorry, Industry and Strategy. So, as I said before, space is a key area to uh, for growth in the UK, but they wanted to promote careers. And it's actually a big cornerstone of what they're doing, actually. So this kind of tour wasn't just there just to kind of promote space itself. It was actually there to promote the wide range of careers. And it, it, it kind of, we fell into their lap, so to speak. But the big part was to avoid the usual suspects. So obviously London, South Kensington, you've got people there that go there without being rude. They've gone there possibly to engage with space science, to engage, you know, they've gone there for the Science Museum, the Natural History Museum. They're kind of prime. A lot of these areas in the UK that we've gone to, I should point out, there's a big issue around them in that um, it's, there's a lot of rural poverty. If you're in London, for example, I grew up in London, 
as I said before, I was widely in participation student, but I could go to the science museum. It was free. We, we went down there a lot. I knew where the jobs were, the city of London's there. So if you grow up in a big city such as London, even though your family may not work in those sectors, you kind of are in the environment, if that makes sense. And you have to, a lot of places, a lot of rural poverty, especially in Cornwall and other places that simply are not engaged with these things really. And so actually one of the great things about going out to these areas was that we could engage with people instead of asking them to come to us, we could go closer to them. Uh, next slide, please, Cara. Sorry. Thank you very much. So the rocket was the central attraction. Unfortunately, it still had Launcher One written on the side of it and Virgin, which I don't think they exist anymore. But anyway, uh, this was planned before that. But it occurred in the school holidays. So there was the idea of uh, communicating with uh, children, but also their parents and their grandparents and their carers, which we were hoping would come along. Um, and, and as Cara has said, part of it was not just to say the scientific areas, but the skills that people could see. So instead of saying you need physics, computer science, mathematics, you could actually see the skills and uh, in these different careers. And, that, and you can see, I think these pictures are taken by you, Cara. But, you know, they had the billboards around this. You could actually, you were kind of... In, constantly engaging with the different careers uh, around the rocket and the other places. So it was kind of uh, generally get the children, their parents used to seeing these different kind of careers. Again, there's space operations nurse there. There's loads. I didn't know space medicine was a thing myself until recently, and I've got a colleague who works in it, Candy. And it's a really big area. Obviously, if you've got people in space, they need to be medically looked after. So it was just widening people's kind of perception of careers in space. Sorry. The next slide, I, um, and I, I saw this, this was on the news, and as soon as I saw it, I quickly texted, emailed Martin or texted off Twitter. I can't remember what we did, and I said, clip it. And luckily he did. He said he'd already done that because here we go. See, sorry, this is in Southampton, I know, because I went to university there, and this is above bar in the background. I know this very well. There's some pubs around there and a club behind it. Sorry, I saw it. But anyway, um, but we're about to see some of the young people that engaged with it. I've always wanted to be a lawyer, but I also like space and the fact that I can do both of them at the same time. And you found out about that today? Yeah, right here at the event. I want to be like a space scientist because um, I really like science, but um, I really like the um, about space particularly. It's just really interesting out there. Only 500 people have ever been. When I saw the child talking about space science, I was like, oh my God, it's worked. And then, and, all right, okay, we've got, um, and, and that was the thing, because I didn't, sorry, space lawyer, I should say. I didn't even, as again, before this was aware that space lawyer was a career. There is actually, in London now, the Institute for Space Law, I think his name's Christoph, I remember his first name, I'm sorry, I can't remember his second name, but we've been engaging with them through the space lab. It's a big growth area, actually. So it's a very important thing. These are the kind of, I would say, the areas in which we need to raise awareness of these things. So primary and secondary school students, it, it's, it's aimed at various age groups. And I would actually say also to uh, people at university, because actually if you're on the pipeline, you go from secondary school to university. Really, if your parents don't have a understanding of the wider career area, even at university, we still even know you're kind of, you could say that you're um, surrounded with space scientists, you still need to know how to get into those careers. And if you've become a lawyer and you want to get into space law, you still need to be aware of that. You might not even know that exists. So again, as we've talked about previously, at primary school level, we hope to use these resources that you can plant those seeds that in 10, 15 years time, they pay off. At secondary, provide careers guidance to students there so they can make choices because obviously, um, you know, people make choices for GCSEs, for A-level, so actually helping them. Um, again, another big area is for young adults, helping young adults be aware that these careers are out there once they've been through university and a few I'm talking to now, actually, um, that they, they need to be aware of, right, these careers exist, but how do I get into it? Uh, parents and uh, carers, again, that's part of the environment around the child. 
So if we can, parents and carers are aware of these different careers, they can actually advise their children or the people in their lives. And obviously with different communities, this is a, um, a, a big thing. And that's not just communities in terms of society, but uh, kind of educational communities. You know, are we talking to lawyers? Are we talking to departments of medicines in our own kind of universities? So they are aware that they can signpost their own graduates to these careers. And sorry, final, sorry, next steps, Cara, sorry, thank you very much. So this is what I'm saying, in terms of our next steps, we're gonna start um, speaking to going into schools and uh, community groups are a big thing. So um, I work with a group called Stem the Violence, which is a not-for-profit where we try and engage with young people to steer them away from knife crime, gang crime, back into education, but that can also be um, apprenticeships. And there's apprenticeships, as Cara pointed out, is a big thing of this. Other, diff uh, other next steps is are looking at different countries. We're talking to NASA, Nikki Fox, luckily head of NASA came to Imperial and she's actually my, I didn't realize my PhD sister, we have the same PhD supervisor, so I managed to collar her. And it can dovetail with a bit of changes into, into the American system, but obviously, there's different employers in different countries. And also we hope to spread this out across Europe, but there's different languages is there as a big thing. Um, uh, part, different partner organizations, I should say. So we've got different industries, you know, different societies. I'm, I'm talking to the Met Office, the Royal Astronomical Society, see if they can spread it out through their networks. The Met Office, because they're based in Exeter, have a lot of schools, a schools network down in Cornwall and Devon. So we're hoping to engage with them. So we're going to use kind of existing networks to push this out. The Met Office love it because a lot of their Earth observation scientists down there, weather monitoring. And finally, we go spread it out again, say, as I said earlier, from national bodies such as NASA, hoping to talk to the European Space Agency and the UK Space Agency are fully on board. So this is where we're hoping to go out. Some things that I've actually come up that I've noticed through emails to the I'm a space person email thing. Um, a big part of this is actually, um, I should say, signposting, helping people outside of the space community to actually where to go for these careers. Because a lot of them, as I say, um, I've actually had a couple of artists email me, 3D modelers, things like that, got in touch and said, Wow, I saw your postcards, really want to get involved, but I don't even know where to go for a career. Does that make sense? And actually, what's quite obvious inside the space community for outside? So I just said to them, there's a space careers website. There's all these different websites you can go to. But actually looking at that, part of it is language. Martin and Cara did an excellent job. Cara again, sorry, you did an excellent job on the things of actually making the language engaging, uh, inclusive. I was looking at these jobs for uh, 3D modelers and stuff like that. And actually to a non-scientist, which these people are on jobs boards, there's still actually, the language is still a barrier if you're a non-scientist. So actually we need to look at that, how we're gonna make sure the language and it's inclusive for people to actually come into these. Are we making a job advert attractive to the people we want? To? Does that sort of make sense? I've seen a lot of the job careers still written as a space scientist, even though they're meant to attract non-space people, if that makes sense. So actually making sure that we don't frighten people off, I think is a big part of it. So this is it here. If you want to go and check out the resources, work it, you can download the postcards to have a test. And um, if you want to work with us, please get in touch. So. Um, Thank you very much. I will hand over to Simon Clark now. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much for that great presentation. Um, before I move on to some questions, I was wondering, do you think it's possible to have a, a quick demonstration of the website? Yeah, so this is the website that I think you can see now. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is the front page of it. And it's all very, it, I mean, we had a design agency involved. so. You can see they did quite a good job that we would not would not have done. Uh, so you can, yeah, you can find a career. There's also you can see resources uh, to to get in contact. There's a link down here as well. Uh, so when we actually go to the resources, uh, 
so here are our po postcards down here. There's also things that were associated with the UK Space Agency tour on this page as well. Um, but you can go onto the page for here and you can see there's a parents, carers and teachers guide here that you can download. You can then also download the postcards with or without po uh, print marks. There is a sheet that tells you which careers have which attributes assigned. Uh, and then if you are using these resources in um, in an event or something, there's also materials for evaluation uh, associated with it as well. So if I go onto the careers page, this is where you can go and then select a career. So if I said that I am creative, uh, then it will filter out these careers and it will tell me about satellite cells, being a planetary geologist, museum curator, uh, doing ground software, business development, or being an artist. Thanks uh, so much for the demonstration. Um, I think uh, one question, I guess, is um, the space sector is quite a dynamic area. Um, I was wondering, how do you perhaps show or identify areas which are perhaps areas of growth? If you're trying to get into the space sector, you might be interested in seeing which areas perhaps you end up becoming, be that, I don't know, debris management or tourism or space policy. Um, can you keep on top of these things? Is that possible? Or is it such a dynamic place? Um, also, I was wondering perhaps we could uh, stop sharing your screen so we could see everyone on there. Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. I, 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 I hopefully we're gonna we've got gonna have continuous funding. Does that make sense to actually continue updating it? Because it's obvious, as you say, again, some of them of the careers in there, such as space tourism, sounds slightly science science fictiony. But actually, it's going to be obviously with Virgin Galactic. I'm trying to remember the other companies that are actually offering well, Blue Origin. I'm trying to remember there's several now that are offering flights. Um, we've tried to, you know, look to the future there. But I think with the website, because it's actually there is the kind of blueprint for it, these can be continuously updated as new roles come out there. And hopefully, as I say, we can continue getting funding that would be something that we would continue with. It would be dynamic. It wouldn't just be a snapshot in time. Hopefully, as you say, but all careers change. And, you know, look at AI kind of thing has suddenly exploded in the past couple of years where kind of a couple of years ago, pre-pandemic, I don't think it was really, it was the kind of a niche you could say and people thought of Terminator and things like that when you talk of AI. Now it seems to be kind of spreading everywhere. So that's suddenly kind of, leapt into the public uh, consciousness so yes hopefully we would keep on top of that i'm sorry i think cara would um say about that yeah i mean i so i was going to use the example of ai as well right because i mean it was sort of like a tiny niche thing that sort of like maybe if you're a consultant you're aware of it or something like that but now it's like you see these articles and in the news and it's like every child in school is using chat gpt and things like that and the thing is so i mean we're looking at launches of like i mean we're going back to the moon right beyond that hopefully we're going to have a moon base then hopefully we're going to go to mars and it's sort of like we can't judge what is going to happen there at all we have no idea what's going to come up as a job we have no idea what's going to start being advertised so. well lunar mining might be a thing i don't know there's josh sorry i know someone there is talking about that so i don't know i don't think we've got that down but there are all sorts of careers as I say, many of them sound just science fictiony, but hopefully we'll just be a continuous evolution of the of the resources. Sure, I mean it's difficult to capture all the uncertainty uh, that happens in such a dynamic industry, of course. Um, uh, another a part you mentioned was uh, generating networks to help support the resources, but that's also, of course, important to um, to also people trying to start their careers. Um, I imagine your organizations you build networks with in order to support the resource, also people, also resources people might go and work for. Um, I suppose you have any advice on like developing these networks, both perhaps from a project perspective, but also from a, a careers perspective as well. As I say, a lot of these have got, for, I suppose the issue we've got is we are coming from this, and as I said, from the space sector. So all of our networks we've got already, does that make sense? So we're looking 
almost beyond the SpaceX. So, so luckily, at the as I say, Nikki Fox came, head of NASA came, and I met a space lawyer there. Now, I had no in, input there, so luckily he had a badge on. And so I was like, kind of cornered him. Does that make sense? But actually looking outside, trying to find these, um, actually, we've got to get into their networks. And they, um, so that is the issue, is that we're already kind of in our spacey area and we're in our kind of comfort zone. And we know, like, Meteorological Society, Royal Astronomical Society, UK Space Agency. We may, you know, we need to go out to, like, I suppose, financial, the financial sector. Does that make sense? And actually sell it to them. So we need to kind of start, yeah, going outside our own zone. And that's the task, as Cara said. I've done it before. I have to, you know, write letters. I've written to Space Command, actually, and I've got no luck with them. So I've actually written physical old school paper letters to them and saying, do you want to get involved with us? Not her back. But, um, you know, we're trying to cast that net wider. But that is right, because otherwise we are just almost preaching to the converted because the, the existing network's are always talking about space already. We need to go beyond that. Hopefully, yeah. So financial, the financial sector, maybe you might want to go into a space career in the financial sector. Just add to their repertoire. If you'll come, I think there's coming at it from producing a resource and then also coming at it from looking to go into the sector, right? And so I think that's part of what we were thinking about when, so even though we're not partnered with all of the companies that are put on the postcards, it was still important to give some example employers because a lot of these companies, before I did the research and sent some emails, I never even knew they existed. I mean, some of them weren't necessarily even contacts of Imperial to start with. Uh, a lot of them, a lot of them are new. So it's, it's about giving that exposure, I guess, to when people will have no clue. Yeah, no, exactly. I think, um, I guess, that's the kind of dual part of networking is need to kind of focus on building your own web. And as you build your own web, you actually discover new boundaries, uh, and new people to kind of really engage with. So I guess part of it is also just, um, look for events, look for opportunities and push that along. Um, uh, one thing that interested me actually was, and this part was more from a personal perspective, was trying to catch people early on in in their careers. Um, for example, both my parents left school when they were 14 and 16, so I had no idea what a PhD was before I went to university. Um, I guess part in terms of trying to diversify people's perceptions of this, then um, I guess, is it, quite, is it quite a long game in that you'll have to start with school? So we already have a resource as well, but you also will be expanding on this resource, perhaps to engage more with schools and outreach activities, perhaps. Um, to give another example, for example, I used to deliver scientific work in museums, and whilst the children are often really occupied in activities, a lot of conversation I had were with adults, who then I'd be like, oh yeah, this is the way we kind of do the science or um, perhaps answer questions about that. And then they'd be like, oh, yeah, I was in physics, but I didn't really go to that school. So there's like a big opportunity there to engage with that. Um, and you won't have resources, but I'm wondering, is that, is that a way you're going to try and engage with uh, schools, perhaps? Or is that like another parallel area? One of the things, is, I'm sorry, I don't know if I'm answering your question saying this, but is that Yes, we can make parents aware of it, like our own parents. Does that make sense? But just because you're aware of the subject, where do they go from there? Does that make sense? And that's a lot of the questions we've actually had on the space person email from the tour has been brilliant. I saw this, saw this in close. So how do I actually, where do I find the jobs? Does that make sense? My son, my daughter is interested in this. And so I think actually there is a thing of raising awareness, but actually there's that whole signposting thing we've got to help and it's only from answering these emails that i actually notice that there's does that make sense great so like we've let the genie out the bottle we started to make people aware of it right what's the next step then we've go next we've got to go beyond awareness we've got signposts to actually say right you've got these skills this is where you can go with those skills so that's actually the big thing is yeah and as I say, there was an art, there's a couple of artists that have been in touch and said, right, loved it, but what do I do now? Are you right? I'm, I'm in chat, I've got 3D modeling skills. And I said, all right, and I've actually said this space careers. Try this. I've actually had a quick search. The 3D mod there are actually more jobs for you than me on this. <laughs> you know, there's you know, you're more employable than me. 
and that's for graduates and i think that's the same for everyone we've actually got to make there's more stages beyond that that we've got to go into as i say it's like let the genie out of the bottle but we've actually got to help people beyond that i think like you said the tour was very good at raising awareness i think what's next is how we're planning to go in schools and things like that a lot of it will then be when they're actually doing the activities associated with the postcards they will be reading about like the routes into careers and things like that i think it's kind of the setting leads it more leads more to the more specifics really sure so i mean if you want to raise awareness you have to approach multiple levels from people in university to people in school to the parents of those people in school but you also got to make sure, like, you've got to have that, that set up ready. You've got the communicating and raising awareness, but you also got to let them down to, like, the actual routes and pathways as well, which is obviously an important part, but you can't really, uh, really neglect. Um, I was wondering, from what you found, was there any really key barriers you found that, um, that kind of people found difficult to um overcome when they're thinking about joining space career sector i think for my part i've highlighted things like just being completely unaware uh, or ignorant when i'm joining the scientific research community um we also mentioned issues along the line of diversity and stuff like that and if people come from diverse backgrounds does that make it harder or even when you're thinking in terms of transferable skills if i'm perhaps progressed into my career and I'm thinking of transferring into a space career I might have the same skills in terms of 3D modeling, but is that appropriate for a space sector compared to my current sector? So I was wondering if there's any kind of key ways you thought people might, you've identified as things to overcome, which might be more or less important. A lot of it is that having an attitude of just like, I should just give it a go in a way, I think is the main thing. Um, but I, th I think a lot of the barriers are, I mean, you've got some of the more typical ones where it's people like, saying like oh well because i'm a girl maybe i can't and then oh well i find maths really hard so i don't think i can do science and so i can't work in space and see so those are the more typical things to try and break down but it's even down to the tiniest little things that i went i did some outreach in a school to i think there were 16 to 18 year old girls and i had a girl say to me well oh well because you do physics surely you must be in a lab um will i be able to do that if i have long nails and even little things like that, they're, they're sort of things that people don't think about, but they might matter a lot to the person. And it's kind of like you've got imposter syndrome, which I think everyone, I think you have to say, I don't, I don't know any scientists that don't actually feel it themselves, but that's inside science. Outside of that, you might think, well, I've got no, I may not have done an A-level in physics or in a STEM subject, and now I'm trying to get into space and a lot of these careers is what I was saying on, on the kind of further, you know, say it's not even desirable. It's an, it's essential to have an understanding of the space sector. Well, actually, if you're a 3D modeler, so I'm going on about because I've just looked at that and it's saying it's just going, it's desirable. It's not essential. Does that make sense? Because, you know, those are things you can learn more about on the job. And I think actually it's not it's making this, the careers more approachable and that's work we've got to do outside of it does that make sense you know this is a big subject but it's actually trying to say well what are the core skills well actually you need to be a good lawyer you need to be a good artist and understanding the space sector well you know you'll find out about that through the job um and and so it's kind of more not shutting people out it's actually helping people understand that employers what do you really want i think we all do that we all want you know the, the, everyone to know about space but you can just n enjoy i don't know half the jobs with actually more than half car brought up i didn't even know exist or in the employer so i i'm even from that point of view so i think is is being open and, and welcoming i think is the key thing actually so we can attract those people in that may feel slightly you know a, a sense of trepidation of actually applying for these jobs yeah, I think part part of it's also a bit of a bigger issue as well. Like you're saying about some skills, for jobs are just listed as like desirable, not essential. But there's a lot of research into that, uh, like different groups are more likely to apply to jobs where they don't fulfil all of those listed requirements and things like that. Like I know, I mean, I mean, most of the stuff I'm aware of is that women are definitely less likely to apply if they don't fulfil all of the criteria than men are and things like that. And so I think that is a bigger overarching issue as well.
Yeah, I, one of my friends actually was saying that he was just applying for crazy jobs and he's very confident. And he said, I said, and he was just, oh, you know, and he got one. And he said, and he said, like, he said, well, I just sort of applied for it because, and I was like, really? I'd never do that. And so, yeah, it's having, you're having that and, it, and, it, and different groups have got that, those barriers in place. So I guess there's a lot of work to do in terms of changing the environment of communi communication. So, so both in terms of perhaps how we communicate job postings as well, um, how we, who and how we select who we engage with as well. Um, we're actually just right out of time. So I can finish off by letting people have a little final comment, perhaps if you want to know about the, the science um, project at all, or it's a key thing or keep your advice. But um, otherwise, I'll say goodbye from Simon, uh, this Simon, but also the other Simon, and oh, Cara. Goodbye. <laughs> Thank you yeah, very um, much. Uh, but is there any final comments at all you want, to, you want to make about perhaps people who want to pursue a career or generate a similar project? Well, if you want to partner with us, speak to us, uh, please get in touch. I think the our, the email is on, on the website. Uh, I think it's Space Person. Oh, God, sorry, I can't remember what the email address is. It's on there. Contact us. Oh, sorry, God, I should know this. I kept the email all the time. But I'm ssfoster at imperial.ac.uk. If you'd like to get in touch and discuss this, you know, I'd be very welcome to. Yeah. The email is a uh, it's spaceperson at imperial dot Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just looking looking it up. Sorry, I've got it on my multitude. Yes. Right. Thanks so much. So yes. Thank you very much. Completely, completely open for our collaboration. Uh, thank you so much for joining this webinar. Um, it will be uploaded onto the each YouTube YouTube channel uh, next week, uh, where it'll be available as a resource. So yeah, thank you so much and bye for now.